Today we are so fortunate um, because we have Dr. Paul Belding here to talk about clematis. Or are you going to talk about clematis? I've been saying it wrong for years, so <laughs> you can say it however you want. I don't know if you, there is a wrong way to say the name of that, really. Uh, Dr. Belding is a local pathologist and gardener who has found a special place in his heart for this wonderful and, and, and plant. Uh, he has generous, generously agreed to share his experience and his knowledge with us today. This is such a versatile plant, I know he has a lot to tell us, so I'm going to let him get started. He has lots of slides, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Paul Belding. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, this is a very, uh, very broad and diverse uh, genus, lots of plants, so I might go kind of fast uh, through the presentation because there is a lot to cover. This uh, picture is sort of what most people visualize when they think of clematis or clematis, uh, but this is a standard early blooming large flowered hybrid called Horn of Plenty. Uh, there's many other forms of this plant and we'll try to just uh, touch on them. There's over 2,800 cultivars uh, in this species, uh, or in this genus, so you just can only scratch the surface in a forum like this. Um, this is a, typically, these are vining perennials. Uh, some do grow in a bushy fashion. They can grow anywhere from three to 50 feet most of them uh, grow wild uh, in North America, East Asia, Southern Europe, and Northern Europe. Uh, they've been cultivated for over 500 years, especially in England. Uh, most of the new cultivars that are just becoming available in the United States are bred in uh, Japan and behind the old Iron Curtain. Uh, several people were laboring behind the Iron Curtain to create these new cultivars, and they were basically unknown or little known to Western gardeners till the wall fell. Um, they're widely available both locally through mail order and, and via the internet. Uh, probably uh, compared to 15 or 20 years ago, you, can probably, you probably have three to five times as many plants to choose from to put in your garden. Uh, I'll just touch briefly on clematis uh, in the wild, uh, the two of the most important types. Uh, clematis patens is the only large flowered uh, plant that grows in the wild. It's native to China and Japan. Virtually every large flowered hybrid that you see in gardens today comes from this plant. And clematis viticella grows uh, from Italy to Turkey along the uh, Mediterranean. and <clears throat> Uh, it's native to southern Europe and it's a very important plant because it's very vigorous and it's very hardy and it's very popular to hybridize with because it imparts these characteristics to the uh, hybrid plants. Uh, and I'll talk quite a bit about the Viticella cultivars. This is a picture of Clematis patens growing in the wild in China. Typically it has a white flower or a pale lavender flower. Um, and this is sort of the mother of all the large flowered clematis you see in gardens today. This is clematis viticella growing in Italy. Uh, it has a small, nodding, dark purple flower, and it'll grow 30 to 35 feet. Uh, very vigorous, very floriferous vine, and uh, this is a very popular uh, plant to hybridize and cross with other cultivars. Um, before we start talking about uh, plants you can use in your garden, we'll just do a little brief uh, thing about culture. Uh, one of the most important things is to plant the plant deep enough. Uh, clematis typically have a big crown of roots that all come to one point where the stems come out, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, you need to get that at least an inch and preferably two inches underground. Uh, the reason for that is uh, if, it, if it gets broken off with the crown above ground, it'll probably die. And the deeper you plant it, the, the more likely it'll come through a very severe winter. Um, you'll need to amend the soil. Uh, clematis is very uh, heavy feeding plant, so uh, you're often, if you read any book about planting a clematis, 
uh, it'll recommend amending the soil with peat or composted cow manure or some variation or combination of thereof. Uh, lots of places where you buy a clematis will even give you a little package of lime to put in the hole. All lime really does is uh, uh, attracts water. So if you have really uh, well-drained soil, you can put lime in the hole. Otherwise, lime doesn't really make that much difference. Gypsum is a useful thing if you have heavy clay soil because gypsum will help your drainage. Uh, and there's quite a few cultivars that don't like heavy clay soil or won't, won't like standing water. Um, one of the uh, classic tenets of growing clematis is the tops of the plants like to be in the sun and the uh, roots like to be in shade. Uh, so you, shade, you can shade the plant with low growing annuals or perennials. Uh, some books even recommend just using paving stones, putting paving stones around the root of the plant to, uh, uh, to shade it. I tend to use things like dianthus or sedum, sedum meteor or sedum, sedum brilliant uh, because you don't ha once you plant them, you can forget about them uh, and they'll last a very long time and they, they do a good job of shading the roots of the plant. Um, as far as feeding the plant, uh, one of the easiest things to do when you plant it, you can put a granular 10-10-10 uh, fertilizer into the soil uh, when you plant it and then feed it again uh, at the end of fall. Otherwise, you can use uh, water-soluble uh, fertilizers and miracle Grow for roses or tomatoes, which is a fairly balanced fertilizer, works fine. Uh, Feed it every two weeks or so until the plant buds out. Uh, after, the, after it's done blooming, you can start feeding it again. Most of the time, the fertilizing makes a difference for the second or repeat bloom. You'll get a very good show of flowers whether you feed it or not the, um, early in the spring. Uh, another thing that the older literature talks about is um, using an antifungal like Benlate to prevent clematis wilt. Um, you can, it's readily available. You can you know, mix it up as a water-soluble uh, product and, and put it around the base of your plants. All the newer literature about clematis basically says clematis wilt isn't curable. And so this really doesn't do any good. So it's, it's somewhat controversial. Um, this is a potted clematis. And you can see the crown the root crown there uh, and the roots exposed and you want to get you want to get that point where all those roots come together one to two inches under the ground. Uh, this is a diagram from a text about how to plant your clematis. Typically make your hole three times as wide and three times as deep. Uh, while you're digging your hole unpot your plant and uh, put it in a five gallon bucket with some water. Uh, I've never done that actually. <laughs> Uh, uh, then in the bottom of your hole, uh, put your compost uh, and peat and then backfill the original soil and mix it with the peat. Uh, and again, keep the crown deep enough. Uh, if you have heavy clay soil, you need to deepen the hole out a little bit and mix the clay uh, with some sort of gravel or gypsum. Uh, gypsum is what... Um, a couple of the clematis nursery I've talked to on the phone have recommended and the gypsum will help drain the excess water away from the root of the plant. Uh, this is just a diagram showing if you want to plant your clematis in a small tree or a shrub, you need to plant it far enough away so that you don't disrupt the roots of the shrub. Uh, then you'll need to stake it sort of at a 45 degree angle to get it over to the trunk. Uh, if you have a single trunk like that. And then uh, true of most clematis, whether you're going to have it tr climb in a shrub, on a wall, or on a trellis, they need a fine mesh to sort of get started climbing in. So you'll need chicken wire or plastic mesh to get them going to climb a structure you want to climb. Uh, this is just another diagram of, of planting a clematis in a tree. 
where you stake it high enough so that it can get up into the branches and then it'll, it'll just climb from there. Uh, this is just a diagram if you're planting it against a wall, a trellis. Uh, they, it's recommended that you keep the, the root 18, 16 to 18 inches away from the foundation uh, just because during a hot summer the foundation will absorb the heat of the sun and it'll, keep, it'll help keep the root from scorching. And you can see in this diagram, this is from an English textbook, they use paving stones there to uh, protect the base of the plant. Uh, pruning, uh, if you're going to grow a lot of clematis, this is probably the biggest hassle. You really have to keep track of what you're planting, the name of the plant, and the type of pruning you have to do. Uh, and since there's you know, several hundred cultivars, you, you might want to just take notes <laughs> as you plant uh, your plants. But uh, type A pruning means no pruning. Uh, sometimes you'll see it referred to as type 1 in a garden catalog. Uh, those plants you would only prune right after they're done blooming if they're getting out of control. And you'd, as soon as they're done blooming, you would lightly trim those up. And the reason for that is to give it as much time to get new wood for next year so you can get flowers on that growth. Um, type B is light prune. Uh, most of the clematis that you'd be fam familiar with that are growing in gardens uh, in Iowa would be type B, the, the very big large flowered hybrids that bloom uh, in mid to late spring would all be of this type. Uh, type 3 clematis or C, group C, are hard prune. These all bloom only on new growth and they should be pruned very, they should just be pruned at the ground. Uh, March is the best time to prune in Iowa. Uh, you don't want to prune in fall because if you prune in fall and then there's a warm snap, the pruning stimulates growth. You don't want to get a, a foot or two of new growth on your clematis and then have winter really set in because it'll, there's a chance, a good chance it'll kill the plant. Um, whatever you do with your first year plants, uh, unless they, you get it from the nursery and it's got dozens of stems already, most first year plants you should just prune them like they're group C so you can get as many new stems as possible. And this is a diagram of uh, how you uh, prune a group A plant and you do this after blooming. Uh, group A clematis bloom very early in the spring, so uh, you'd be out in May probably uh, pruning these back. Group B, the diagram looks almost exactly the same except you're pruning in March uh, before growth really starts. And the uh, group B plants basically bloom from a combination of new growth and off the old wood, but you get your best crop of flowers and your biggest flowers off the old wood. And group C is the easiest to remember. You just cut it off at the ground. Uh, and here's an example of a clematis growing in a pot. And it just has one stem. And some plants just have a genetic predisposition dis to do that, no matter how hard you, you prune them. But in general, you don't want your clematis to look like that. You want it to look like that with seven or eight stems uh, coming out of the ground. Uh, diseases, uh, far and away the most important disease is clematis wilt. It's a fungus that blocks the water transport in the plant. So uh, a typical scenario is it's late May or June and your plant is growing like crazy. It's all butted out and you're just counting the days till the flowers open up and you come out one day and the whole, the whole plant is collapsed. All the leaves and buds are hanging straight down like someone has just pruned it. And uh, it's very common with the, uh, largest, uh, the large flower hybrids and the double uh, flowered hybrids. Uh, all you can really do is cut off the plant, that, the parts of the plant that are affected and throw it away. And you should actually uh, clean your pruners with bleach so that you kill the fungus on there. Uh, if the whole plant collapses and, you don't, and you're not a patient person, you can dig everything up and dig up all the dirt and throw it away, and then you want to clean all of your implements, again, with bleach. 
Um, most of the time, it doesn't really kill the plant. It just repeatedly sets it back so it won't look good for several years. Most plants eventually become immune to it. You know, and maybe after five or six years, it might look as good as it did uh, before it uh, got the disease. Again, controversial, uh, you know, older literature says you can dig up the plant, put the root ball in a benlate solution that will treat it out and then replant it. Uh, most of the newer textbooks basically say clematis wilt's incurable. <clears throat> uh, other diseases, uh, mildew, mildew uh, affects the later blooming ones uh, more prominently. It usually doesn't kill the plant. It's more of a annoyance. It just causes the foliage to look unsightly. You get a white powder on the foliage and eventually the, the leaves will yellow. It usually occurs in areas of the garden where there's not much air circulation and it's most common during the hottest part of the summer. And it, you can treat it with topical fungicides. I, I've never had a plant die from it. I've had plants get it, but I've never had a plant die from it. <clears throat> Pests. Uh, uh, aphids are actually the least of your problems with <laughs> clematis. Uh, the biggest problem I have uh, is rabbitzilla <laughs> in my garden. Uh, rabbits do two things. They'll eat the new growth right when they come out of the ground in the, in the spring. Uh, one thing you can do about that that is fairly effective is the Repelex tablets. Um, they look like Alka-Seltzer and they make everything taste bitter. Uh, when they're soaked into the roots and uh, they basically uh, make it taste bad to the animals. That works fairly well. The other thing the rabbits do is if you don't have a wire cage all the way around the base of the plant in the winter, they just come and prune it all off at the ground. So uh, if you have a type A clematis, you won't get any flowers at all. If you have a type B clematis, you won't get as many flowers and they'll be smaller. And if you have type C clematis, it's perfect. You know, he does the job for you and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and the Repelex tablets really don't affect the, the winter pruning. And I, I assume it's just because the plant's dormant and the taste is, is out of the stems as the plant goes dormant and the sap goes back into the roots. Uh, these cute little guys have killed more of my plants than, than anything. Uh, they like to tunnel near foundations, and foundations are a good place to plant your clematis, uh, but the tunneling exposes the roots to air, and it definitely will, will kill them. I've had several plants killed by uh, chipmunks or pocket gophers, and there are some solutions. Uh, most of them end up killing the chipmunk, and I have two young daughters, and you know, it was, it's not a popular thing, so I just had to stop. I, I put a rat trap out one time and, and trapped one and I came home from work and they were waiting for me in the driveway <laughs> with their arms crossed like this. <laughs> Dad, we want to talk to you about killing the chipmunk. And uh, so I went to go get him out of the trap and uh, it was early spring and all the bulbs were blooming. So there were lots of daffodils and tulips laid by my daughters around the, the chipmunk as a memorial. So I really had to stop. So. So I don't, I kind of take a live and live, let live attitude, although this, is, this was me in the garden <laughs> a few years ago trying to get the rabbits and um, I, I was really death on moles too. Uh, you know, I had every kind of mole trap ever made trying to eradicate them. Uh, this is just the summary slide. Uh, moles actually, even though they tunnel all over the landscaped areas, I maybe have had one plant killed by moles, so I have adopted a live and let live policy with moles unless they're killing the grass in the lawn. Um, insects, really not a major problem. Uh, soapy water really will eradicate a heavy in insect infestation. The red mites are fairly immune to soapy water, but you, know, you don't usually have to use uh, nuclear weapon type insecticides to eradicate insects from your clematis. Um, uses in the garden, uh, 
what everyone's most common with, you know, climbing on structures. You, you know, you can put them on rose arches, trellises, fences, fence posts, obelisks. You can train them to a wall, and, th and that's what we're all most familiar with. They're also quite useful, though, uh, climbing through shrubs and small trees. Um, in the English literature, they talk a lot about using clematis and climbing roses, and I'll show you a picture of uh, a combination in a garden here in Iowa City. I tend to um, plant clematis in the shrubs that are the back, uh, sort of the backbone of most people's gardens, viburnums, chokeberries, service berries, rhododendron, um, variegated dogwood. Uh, if you're going to do that, try to select a clematis that won't overwhelm the shrub, so you s sort of match the clematis, uh, how, how big the vines will get with how big the shrub gets. Uh, I really like to do that because all those shrubs tend to bloom early in the spring, and then some of them have fall foliage for interest, uh, so they bloom in the spring, then the clematis climbs up through the plant, sort of finds the sun, and blooms and you get the illusion that the, the shrub is blooming later in the season. Uh, and it works pretty well. If you're going to do that, make sure uh, if, you want, if you have a shrub with really light foliage like a lilac, something with a dark flower like jackmanny is a perfect plant, something that contrasts. If you have viburnums with sort of dark foliage, white flowers uh, or pink flowers might work better so you have a contrast so the flowers will stand out. Uh, some of the lower growing or bushier uh, clematis are good to combine with perennials in the border. You can grow them as ground covers. Uh, I've, I've tried it a couple times. Uh, uh, you can have them tumble over walls uh, and you can also grow them in containers. Um, and carry them over season to season in containers. Um, I've not, I don't have much experience with that. Uh, but virtually any clematis you can grow for one season in a container. Uh, so if you're out shopping and you just you see a plant in a nursery and it's all butted out and you can't resist buying it and you take it home and there's really no place to put it in your garden, you can pot it and just leave it in on your patio, put a small obelisk there and let it and enjoy it for the season and then just cut it, cut it back and give it to a friend to plant. Uh, the other thing you can do is I've seen people that actually grow them in hanging baskets, in an oversized hanging basket. Uh, you, you need a one or two year plant to do this because they'll quickly outgrow the, the pot, but you can grow them for one season and they'll, do, they'll drape out and, and, and flower as long as they have enough sun. Uh, and it, and then at the end of the season, if you don't have a place to plant it, cut it back and give it to someone else and they can put it in their garden. Uh, this is kind of a panoramic view of our backyard. It's a very crowded uh, shot. I'll try to move the cursor arrow here. We could see all the different structures we have clematis climbing on. The arrow right there is on a vine pole, a little homemade vine pole. There's a a rose arch there with several climbing on it. Uh, this is pretty far away shot, so uh, let's see. I better look at the screen so I can see where I'm going. We have an old garden gate here with clematis growing on it. Here's another rose arch way to the right. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Does it work? Okay. And a little lattice fence that you put on the top of the fence with clematis growing on it. And we've got some better slides here. This is panoramic view of the backyard. There's a split rail fence with several different cultivars on it. We have lots of wire obelisks. There's an obelisk there with one on it. This is a lilac bush in the corner. And this dark purple here is Jack Manny climbing through the lilac. The neighbor's fence has several trellises on it. This is just a close up. Uh, split rail fence is a really good thing to plant clematis on. Uh, this is actually two plants, Prince Charles and Pearl de Azur. Uh, they're both late blooming hybrids. They have sort of sky blue flowers. They're the closest thing to true blue in clematis. The difference is Pearl de Azur will grow 20 feet. 
Prince Charles will grow eight feet so it's easier to keep under control. So Prince Charles is like a poor man's pearl d'azur. Uh, same split rail fence. This is Niobe. Niobe is a very popular early blooming cultivar. It's sort of a dark brick red and fades uh, after it opens. The more carmine uh, colored one with the sort of pinkish center is an old French cultivar called Ville de Lyon. And this is Rouge Cardinal. Uh, split rail fence gives you lots of room to plant uh, you know, as many cultivars as you want. This is just an old uh, farm fence with some barbed wire on it. Rouge Cardinal climbing through the barbed wire. Standard trellis with some hybrid lilies in front to shade it. Large flowered uh, early blooming hybrid growing on it. This is uh, not from our garden. Uh, this is a wall uh, that's got a Montana clematis trained to it. Uh, uh, I won't talk too much about Montana clematis because you just really can't get them to bloom in Iowa. Uh, here's a close-up of a wire obelisk with Romantica growing in it. Romantica is an Estonian uh, a cultivar from a man named Uno Kavistic. Uh, the flowers open almost black. It's very dark purple. Uh, very easy cultivar to grow. You don't have to do anything to take care of it. Uh, it's, it's like a wonderful no-care plant. Uh, this is an example of a clematis climbing through a small tree. You can sort of see uh, this is sort of a sunken area in our garden. Here's the, the timber wall. This is a double um, flowering Chinese plum, which is actually blooming right now in our garden. And this is uh, a Viticella cultivar, Emilia Plata, climbing through it and blooming uh, several weeks after the tree's done blooming. This is just the same uh, tree and clematis from the other side. Uh, this is a sumac growing out in uh, back of the house uh, off of our property. property. This is another Viticella cultivar called Carmencita that's just growing through the, uh, growing up the sumac. This is a very, oh, I think my, this is a very, very popular red clematis called Julia Coravon climbing in a service berry. Uh, this is another, you know, can't miss plant. You don't, uh, there, you don't have to be able to do anything to take care of this plant. It's, uh, you'd have to like spray it with Roundup to kill it. Uh, <laughs> this is a very popular old white clematis. This is my sister-in-law's garden. Another, again, an obelisk. This is Henry I growing on an obelisk. This is a vine pole, a homemade vine pole with Ernest Markham on it. Uh, kind of lost my pointer here, but if you think the vine pole looks crooked, you're right. Uh, this is what happens when you go to your neighbors and walk through their garden and have one or too many glasses of Chardonnay and then come back and put your vine pole in. Uh, uh, actually, it's just settled over time. It's several years old. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Ramona, a very popular early, flower, early flowering cultivar. It's a Canadian hybrid, so it can stand just about any winter. And it's uh, this is in our neighbor's garden, and it's climbing in a climbing rose. Uh, this is a very popular cultivar called the President. It's climbing uh, through uh, chokeberry in our garden. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the President later. It's a very popular plant, and a, a, it's a very versatile plant. This is another Viticella cultivar. This is called Etoil Violet, and it's climbing in a variegated dogwood. And you could see the light uh, bitone color of the foliage and how the dark purple just jumps out. So it makes a nice contrast, so you'll notice it right away. Uh, this is HF Young, in a, again, in a container. This is Durandi. This is actually the cover of a textbook because it's the best picture of a Durandi I could find. This is an Integrifolia hybrid. 
The integrifolia types of clematis don't really climb. They have a real rigid, wiry stem. Uh, they're really good combining with other uh, perennials in the border. Uh, and Durandi, because of the yellow at, at its center, I think looks really good with bright yellow flowers. You could plant it in the middle of a clump of daylilies, like tetraploid daylilies with a bright yellow flower, and let it amble through them. <clears throat> okay, now we're, I'm just going to talk about the seven or eight biggest families of clematis and how you can use them in the garden. Um, alpine and macro petal of clematis come from northern Europe, so they're very cold hardy. There are no prune plants, which means, you know, if you do have rabbits and deer, you've got to have a fence, your whole garden fenced or a fence all the way around them. Uh, they're, they can get quite tall, so they're good for trellises and large obelisks. They have very attractive seed heads, so after they're done blooming, uh, they still have some interest in the garden. Uh, they're a little touchy on the types of soil they'll tolerate. And this is a, a Latvian cultivar called Riga. It's an alpine clematis. And uh, some of these cultivars are just spectacular when they're established plants. The, you cannot even see the foliage because there's so many flowers. This is another alpine clematis that's quite popular called Frankie. And Francis Rivers is uh, also a, a popular cultivar. Uh, most of the alpine clematis are going to be white, dark purple, or, or lavender. Uh, the macro petalas look like uh, alpine clematis, except the flowers are almost always double. Uh, Markham's Pink is a very old cultivar. Madewell Hall is a very popular uh, plant. I used to have one of these until the chipmunks killed it. <laughs> uh, you know, it grew 10 to 12 feet, covered the uh, trellis, and uh, it was blooming one year on April 7th. Uh, so it blooms very early. And, you know, if, as long as it doesn't get pruned inappropriately, it'll produce lots of flowers. Uh, this is another uh, dark blue or purple cultivar called Lagoon, very popular. Um, in general, you won't find a lot of alpine or macropetala cultivars locally, but um, virtually any mail order or internet nursery that specializes in clematis will have lots of choices. And this is just a representative picture of a seed head after blooming is done. Uh, the Montana clematis are spectacular plants. They'll grow up to 30 feet tall. They have four petaled flowers that look like a dogwood tree flower. They're often fragrant. Um, uh, when my wife and I were in Germany uh, in May, we saw one climbing up over a cottage on the uh, Baltic Sea. I, it was 35 or 40 feet tall. It was covered in pink flowers. Um, but I'm not going to show you any pictures of Montana clematis because you just, I just don't know anybody who grows them in Iowa who can get them to bloom. And the reason being the, the root is hardy in Iowa, so they'll grow every year from the root. And they do have very nice, fine, laced foliage, and it's bronze. Uh, new foliage is bronze, like rose growth, but you'll, you just won't get any flowers. So uh, uh, maybe if you live in Keokuk, you might be able to have, have it uh, come back to life and give you flowers, but I, not, I don't know anybody that's been able to get them to bloom in Iowa. So now I'll move on to the early blooming large flowered cultivars. This is the clematis that almost everyone is familiar with. Uh, these are sort of the Cadillac of clematis. You get flowers maybe eight, nine, or ten inches across. They'll bloom very heavily in late spring, and then you'll get sporadic smaller flowers later uh, in the season. They are susceptible to cl clematis wilt, but they usually, uh, usually won't kill the plant. Um, and if you want to get your best uh, show of flowers, you really do need to protect the base of the plant during the winter so it doesn't get inappropriately pruned. Uh, they're somewhat tolerant of clay soils, but not like the later blooming flowers. Uh, this is, I'll just uh, show several popular varieties. 
there's just so many in this category, I, I couldn't show you every different cultivar you could plant. Uh, Gillian blades, very popular because of the ruffled edge to the petals. It's basically white, although when it first opens, the outer edges have a real pale lavender cast to them. It's a very compact plant, so uh, it's a good one to plant on, like, your mailbox. You know, it'll stay six to eight feet. You could grow this one in a container if you wanted to. Uh, this is Henry Eye. This has huge white flowers. Uh, it's a very popular old cultivar, probably from the mid-1800s. Uh, you can see that it has sort of dark brown anthers in the center. Um, the only problem with trying to grow Henry Eye is uh, you've got less than a 50-50 chance of, unless it's blooming when you buy it in the nursery, you've got less than a 50-50 chance if you got, buy a plant labeled Henry Eye that you're going to get Henry Eye. Um, I've tried to buy Henry Eye three times, and this is what I've gotten, Marie Bosla, uh, which is also a very popular cultivar. But uh, so, and so for some reason, uh, people in the nursery business have just been calling any white clematis Henry I. <laughs> but this is what Henry I should really look like. It has a big star-like flower. There's big gaps between the petals there. Whereas Marie Bosla, the flower is more rounded. The anthers are white or yellow. And there's not as much gap between the petals. And the, the petals are actually much heavier or thicker substance. And this is still a real beautiful plant. Uh, and it's also very popular. Um, this is a Japanese cultivar that's about the closest to sky blue or true blue in Clematis. Uh, it's a really gaining popularity. Uh, it doesn't produce flowers as heavily as some of the old-fashioned cultivars, but it's, it's a very popular cultivar. It's called Fuji Mizume, which basically translates as Wisteria Maiden. It's a very nice plant. This is Ramona again. Uh, Ramona is a real reliable old plant. Uh, if you want to plant Ramona, I would say give it an east facing because uh, Ramona opens sort of a dark purple, but the sun will definitely wash out the color. Um, this is two clematis growing together in our garden. The dark purple plant in the center is called the President. Uh, the president is my wife's favorite cultivar, and it is a very good cultivar for a number of reasons. It's probably the best clematis for holding its color in bright sunlight. You know, the, it just retains the dark purple uh, for a very long time. The plants don't get washed out. Uh, the, other, the other thing I like about the president, I've never had one get clematis wilt. Uh, and uh, it blooms very heavily even if the rabbits prune it to the ground. Uh, I still get lots of flowers from it. And uh, this is the president growing in a chokeberry. It's not really blue like this. This is a picture taken in low light, so it makes it look bluer than it is. But it's very rich, dark, dark purple. Very popular, and you can find it anywhere. This is one that's a little less well known. That's a very pretty white flower with a red center. It's uh, called Miss Bateman. Uh, it's still pretty easy to find mail order or on the internet. Uh, this, is, this plant has never had clematis wilt and even though the rabbits prune it every year at the ground, I still get lots of flowers from it. And it has very nice rounded uh, symmetric flowers. Um, this is uh, another popular cultivar because it's close to blue. It's called Will Goodwin, growing on our split, split rail fence. Uh, it's not that blue. I didn't do anything to alter the picture. The, the scanner did this to the uh, picture, but now I know how things turn out so blue in nursery catalogs. <laughs> so, uh, but it's a very, it's a very nice uh, sort of lavender blue flower with yellow anthers, and you can usually find it locally. Um, Niobe is the darker red flower here. This is probably one of the three most popular red clematis uh, you can grow. It opens sort of a dark red or a brick red and, and fades in the light. Uh, you can treat this one as a hard prune or a light prune. It doesn't really matter much. You'll still get lots of flowers. 
this is everyone's idea of what a clematis should look like. Uh, Nellie Moser, uh, probably the most planted clematis except for maybe Jack Manny. Um, lots of people like bitoned or barred clematis. This is probably the most reliable one for giving you a really distinct bar. It's called Mrs. Thompson. Uh, has a sort of a dark blue or violet edge with a dark red bar. Um, this one will take a while to establish in your garden. You won't get as many flowers as quickly, uh, but it, uh, it does have a very nice distinct bar. And it, uh, some other ones you could grow are called fireworks or sugar candy. Uh, <clears throat> this one, this is Ramona growing with another barred variety at the top uh, that's called Etoil de Malicorn. Um, the bar is not as distinct there. So, this is uh, out of focus. <laughs> Warsaw Nike is another uh, popular early blooming cultivar. Uh, it's from a Polish hybridizer. It gives a nice plummy. Uh, reddish purple, nice rounded flowers. Uh, the flowers aren't as big as some of the others. Uh, late blooming large flowered uh, clematis. Uh, I'd recommend these over the early blooming ones because they're just, they're less work. Uh, you plant them and forget about them. They, they're all hard prune. They don't get clematis wilt at all. You can get them in a large variety of colors and they'll tolerate almost any soil and uh, even though they bloom later in the season and the flowers are smaller you get a huge crop of flowers and they bloom longer than the early blooming large flowered hybrids uh, that's the standard jack manny dark velvety purple usually four to six petals and white anthers uh, this uh, is another uh, polish hybrid uh, the f picture looks white because it's washed out, but it's a very pale blue, uh, three to four inch flower. Uh, I have one of, this is not from my garden, but uh, I have one of these in my garden growing on a rose arbor, and it real reliably produces flowers every year, and I've never had any problems with it. Prince Charles is actually a viticella hybrid, uh, but I show it here because the flower looks almost identical to to Pearl d'Azur. Uh, Pearl d'Azur, extremely vigorous vine and very floriferous, sort of a sky blue flower. Uh, this is an old French cultivar and uh, if you're a real clematophile and want to go to one of the holy grails of cl clematis <laughs> culture, this is Sissinghurst, England with a huge Pearl d'Azur growing in the garden there. <clears throat> Victoria is a very old, uh, probably from mid-1800s, cultivar. Uh, uh, it's actually more purple than this photograph shows. It looks very similar to, to Jack Manny to me. It just, uh, the flowers are more rounded and full, so it's, there's no gaps between the petals. Uh, this is a, another late flowering hybrid that I can never really pronounce. Uh, <laughs> it's, it looks very similar to the president, except uh, the, the anthers are white instead of dark red, and th this will fade in the sun, and it does bloom quite a bit later than the president. Rouge Cardinal, uh, you could probably find this almost anywhere. It won't bloom as heavily as uh, some of the other late flower hybrids, but it's, it's a fairly desirable plant because of the velvety sheen to the petals. Uh, and I have several of those in our garden. Uh, Ville de Lyon is an old French hybrid, and these are late flowers, so they're kind of washed out, but they're a real vivid carmine, uh, carmine red when they first open. And uh, again, this is a real reliable plant that will bloom very heavily. Ernest Markham, uh, probably one of the three most popular red clematis. Uh, another real reliable plant, no disease problems. Uh, this is an obelisk in our garden, and it has two of the Estonian 
uh, hybrids on it that I would highly recommend. We have Romantica, which is the dark purple flower uh, dominating most of the obelisk. And then at the lower left on the obelisk, you've got these big white star-like flowers. Uh, this is uh, called Rococola, sort of like Coca-Cola. <laughs> uh, these are both uno cavistic hybrids from Estonia. And the Rococola is about the biggest flower you could get in a late blooming hybrid. Uh, it won't establish as quickly. And you can see how those plants are the same age, and you can sort of see how uh, Romantica has sort of taken over the obelisk. But uh, it's a big ivory star-like flower. Uh, I would I would recommend any of the Estonian hybrids because they're they'll never die out in the winter because it's really cold in Estonia. So if it comes through uh, an Estonian winter, an Iowa winter will never kill it. Uh, they tend to take off later, get going later in the spring, and then they really rapidly, once they get going, they really rapidly grow, and they produce lots of flowers. Uh, this, I think I've got several pictures of Romantica here, so just to emphasize to you how much I like it. Uh, <clears throat> and never had a problem with this plant. This is another Eastern European plant called uh, Negertoyanka, uh, literally means little negress girl. Uh, it's a dark, plummy purple. It's very popular, uh, hard prune. Don't have to do anything to take care of it. Uh, this could be really hard to find. Uh, if you wanted a plant that was similar, you could probably find a plant more easily called Gypsy Queen uh, that would look very similar to this. Uh, double and semi-double forms. I don't grow very many because they're real wimpy. Uh, they just, uh, they're the most susceptible to clematis wilt, so they're the most likely to die, uh, and they're most likely to die from it. They don't produce a ton of flowers. Uh, usually, if you've taken good care of them, on the old wood, you'll get a nice crop of, crop of double flowers, and then later in the season, on new growth, you'll get single flowers. I have a few that I'd recommend. This is probably the most popular double, called Bell of Joaquin. Uh, it's a real silvery mauve and very, uh, very many petals. If you're going to put one in your garden, I'd put this one in your garden. It's mul called multi blue, and it's actually a seedling of the president. Same color as the president, except it's double or triple flower. Uh, the one we have is on a north-facing wall, so it gets nothing but shade, and it still br produces flowers. So it's a good clematis for shade. It also uh, is planted in an area where in the spring, if it's wet, there's lots of standing water, and it uh, doesn't, it, it's never gotten clematis wilt, even though it's, it's in heavy clay and it's in standing water a large part of the time. Uh, this is Proteus growing in a rhododendron. Uh, I've had pretty good luck with it. It doesn't ever produce a ton of flowers. This is about as good as it ever looks for me, this sort of off-white or gray flower. In lots of gardening books, it'll be really bright pink, but I don't really think, uh, I think it's false advertising. <laughs> uh, Viticella cultivars are late blooming cultivars. They're all uh, related to Cle Clematis viticella that I showed you at the beginning of the uh, presentation. I would highly recommend all of these cultivars. They, you know, they'll thrive in drought. They'll thrive in any soil. They'll produce a large crop of flowers. They don't get any diseases. Uh, this is the oldest clematis known uh, in cultivation. It, it was being grown by English royalty in gardens probably in the 1500s. Uh, <clears throat> Purpuraplena elegans has a small rose-colored double flower. This, this plant will grow 20 to 25 feet. And uh, I have a couple of these growing in redbud trees. Uh, Betty Corning, very popular uh, viticella hybrid. A little unique, the flowers are sort of these nodding bells. Uh, this is uh, one of the only clematis you could grow that might have a light scent, uh, except for the sweet autumn clematis. <clears throat> this is probably the most popular red 
clematis uh, grown in the United States. Uh, Madame Julia Coravan, uh, an outstanding plant. Uh, Viticella abundance, smaller flower, real bright red. Uh, I don't think it, despite its name, it doesn't produce as many flowers as some of the other Viticellas in my garden. This is another Uno Cavistic uh, Estonian hybrid. This is Viticella viola, uh, real dark purple flower with a yellow center. Uh, again, no disease problems at all. This is an unusual one, uh, which you may want to grow just so you can have an unusual clematis. It's not the most aesthetically appealing clematis. It's uh, one of the few white Viticella cultivars, Alba luxuriens. You can see how irregular and gappy the flowers are. And they, when they first open, they have big blotches of green uh, on them. Uh, so if you're a clematophile and just want to have one of everything, I suppose you might want it. Uh, Viticella minuet, very popular in Europe. Uh, little four, five pointed star-like flowers with a red edge. Uh, no fragrance, but just clouds and clouds of these small flowers. <clears throat> uh, one thing about Viticellas, if you're looking in a mail order catalog and uh, you're seeing the zone, the hardiness zone. Some of these mail order catalogs will say that these Viticella are zone six. It's not true. I've never had any Viticella not come back after winter. I, I'd say they're all zone three or four. Uh, I've never had any die from a cold Iowa winter. Uh, this is a Swedish variety, uh, Viticella carmencita. It's a real bright red. And it'll grow 20 feet, so it's a good one for a small tree. Uh, probably can't find it locally, but it's a good mail. You can find it almost at any mail order plant that specializes in uh, clematis. Uh, this is another very old Viticella cultivar, and it's not as popular because you can see there's gaps between the flowers. This is Margot Coster, but you, uh, you can see how heavily it blooms. Uh, it's a real reliable plant in our garden. Polish spirit, uh, probably lots of you have a Polish spirit in your garden. It, uh, it produces so many flowers you can't see the foliage. Uh, it's, a, it's a great plant. Uh, another picture of Etoil Violet. Uh, the Integrifolia, Integrifolia hybrids, these are the low growing, non climbing clematis. They tend to have a little nodding bell shaped flower. Uh, for, for years, all you could really get was Integrifolia and Integrifolia alba, which would be a purple flower or a white flower. Uh, but there's an uh, increasing number of Integrifolia cultivars. Most of them come from Japan. Uh, they're good border plants. They don't get clematis wilt. And this is uh, a very popular one. Uh, Durandi, real nice indigo blue flowers. Uh, and it looks good with yellow, uh, bright yellow perennials. And I've uh, never had any disease problems with Durandi. This is Blue Boy. This gets a little taller than Durandi. It's a Canadian hybrid, uh, so it will never die after an Iowa winter. And it just produces clouds of these nodding pale blue flowers. Uh, you know, cut it off at the ground, and every year there's twice as many stems as before. So this is a very vigorous uh, and heavy blooming plant. This is a new cultivar, and it's called Arabella. It has these star-like violet flowers. And unlike other integrifolias, they kind of look up at you. Uh, all the other ones have flowers that hang down or nod. Uh, there's also another uh, cultivar called Yuli, J-U-U-L-I, that would be almost identical. Uh, <clears throat> this only grows about three to seven feet. Uh, it's, it's a very popular new cultivar, so uh, lots of places sell it out every year. Uh, this is a Japanese cultivar growing in our neighbor's uh, 
garden, uh, Integrifolia ragucci. Um, you can get this from a nursery in Oregon called Joy Creek Nursery, and they sell it out every year. It's very popular in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in their catalog, they describe it growing, they grow it with hostas. Uh, I don't, can't imagine growing an eight-foot plant with hostas, but uh, this is the characteristic flower, real dark, plummy purple uh, flower, and you can see how heavy the stems are. All of the Integrifolia hybrids make really good cut flowers if you want clematis as a cut flower. <clears throat> Another Eastern uh, European Integrifolia hybrid, Alianushka. Uh, there's also several newer hybrids of this that are really dark red, like rip lipstick red. Uh, again, you probably wouldn't find them locally, but you could certainly find them through mail order or the internet. Taxensis clem clematis, I don't have much experience with. These are small flowered, they're usually pale pink to dark red, and the flowers look like a tulip, so they look up at you. And they're probably the most appropriate one to grow as a ground cover if you want to try it. Um, they're real touchy about the soil uh, they're in, uh, so I think they need pretty good soil. I've planted them a couple times as ground covers, and they, uh, you know, to climb like through other low-growing plants, and the other plants, I think, just crowd them out and kill them. So uh, this is Ladybird Johnson uh, and Princess Diana, uh, real dark red. Uh, I've never gotten one to grow long enough to bloom, so if any of you have, good, good for you. But, uh, and I, I've only planted two of them, so... I don't have a lot of experience with them. Uh, that sort of leaves a grab bag of very late blooming small flowered uh, varieties. Uh, the most common one that you'd be familiar with is Clematis terniflora or Sweet Autumn cl Clematis. Grows 20 to 30 feet, has clouds of white flowers with a nice hawthorn scent. Uh, typically would start blooming in August into September. Uh, you know, lots of people tell stories of, you know, it grows and breaks the trellis off because it's so vigorous. Uh, this will also seed itself in your garden. Uh, so if you don't want to dig up clematis seedlings all the time, you may not want this, but it, it's a really good plant at providing a mass of color in your garden at a time when uh, not much is blooming. Uh, the other thing I like to do with it, it's always so impossible to keep it trained on the trellis. Uh, we had peonies growing near it. If you just train a few shoots into the peonies, you, know, you get these little white star-like flowers climbing through the peony foliage. It looks, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, you, and I, I've seen pictures in garden catalogs of these grown as a, a ground cover where they plant it in the middle of a bunch of perennials and then they make sure the stems are all fanned out, uh, but this could like, you know, this is like kudzu, it can just cover up and kill anything. <laughs> this, this did not scan well. This is a recently popular uh, small flowered clematis, Tridernata rubromarginata. Uh, rubromarginata just means the flowers have red margins. It also has a nice hawthorn scent. This will bloom about a month earlier than Sweet Autumn Clematis, but in other respects, it's very similar, similar scent, very aggressive uh, vine, uh, produces hundreds and hundreds of flowers. Um, I've planted three of these, and I would say it's about a 50-50 chance that it will come through the winter in Iowa. I've got one left that's living. So uh, This is another small flowered white variety that uh, probably should be planted more. It's purpura recta, and it's popular with a lot of gardeners because it has this dark maroon foliage that lasts a long time, uh, and it has small white flowers that are fragrant, sort of like a sweet autumn clematis. This is one as it's uh, growing, when it gets done blooming, if you cut it back hard, you'll get more of the bronze foliage and you'll uh, uh, also encourage more flowers. <clears throat> It, uh, 
I think it looks best just ambling through perennials. Uh, I have it planted in the middle of a bunch of peonies. Uh, and there is one picture from a catalog here of it climbing through perennials. Uh, there's a couple new cultivars of this. Uh, one's called Sirius Black, like the character from uh, Harry Potter. <laughs> and another one's called Velvet Knight, but they both have much darker uh, purple foliage and that, that persists all season. If you don't prune this after it blooms, the purple foliage will all eventually turn green. So. I, the Tanjutica hybrids are the only place you'll find yellow in clematis. And they're not very winter hardy in Iowa. The other reason people grow them is for the seed heads, which can look kind of dramatic. Um, I've never tried to, to grow these. Uh, but I've talked to other people that say they don't reliably come back after winter in Iowa. So. Uh, if you want to grow the queen mother of Clematis uh, Vitalba, or old man's beard, it'll grow 50 feet. Uh, it has small white flowers. Uh, people really grow it for the seed heads. This is what the seed heads look like in winter. Um, I have one that's never bloomed because uh, I, I don't think it gets enough sun. So if somebody wants it, I'll dig it up and, <laughs> and deliver it to your door. So. <laughs> Um, resources, there's dozens of websites. The one I would uh, recommend is the International Clematis Society. Uh, I think it's uh, referenced there in your handout. Uh, because from there, there's links where you can go to about a dozen clematis nurseries, three or four of which are in the United States, uh, and you can order directly off the internet. Uh, one's called Chalk Hill Clematis in uh, California, and Joy Creek Nursery in Oregon. Those would be the two uh, I would recommend if you want to order them uh, via the internet. Uh, I do have some of my textbooks here that you're welcome to look at during the question and answer, answer session. Most of these are English. This is probably the most thorough reference, an illustrated encyclopedia of clematis by two English authors. Now, if you go to the International Clematis website, there's also a link to the American Clematis Society. And the president of that society is a woman named Edith Malik. And she's written two books exclusively about growing clematis in the United States, uh, which I haven't read. But uh, they might be more appropriate uh, if you want uh, to read more about uh, clematis. I really didn't plan on talking at all about hybridizing. Uh, or dividing your clematis. Uh, most of the time you don't have to divide them. Uh, they're fairly easy to hybridize. There's probably another 100 new hybrids a year that get put into this clematis register. Uh, one reason is if you just collect the seeds and plant them and are patient enough to wait for them to get big enough to bloom, often they look nothing like the parent. So like, that's where a lot of new cultivars come from people, people are compulsive enough to collect all the seeds and plant them and take care of them until they get big enough to bloom. Uh, other hybridizers will do something like this where they collect the pollen and uh, fertilize a specific plant because they like the characteristics of two plants and they want, they want to combine them. Uh, I, I don't know, it just seems a little too time consuming for me. Uh, this is the last garden reference uh, far side I could find. In the, uh, so, so, and then I've got a few extra pictures here, but that's basically a real quick rundown. Uh, you know, with 2,800 different plants, it's really hard to give a very all-inclusive lecture on clematis. So, I guess we can let Melanie go ahead and start the refreshments and we can do questions. Um, I think basically the only website you really need to be able to find is the International Clematis Society. If you just go to any search engine and type that in, uh, 
you'll be able to find it. And then there's links that will take you just about anywhere. You can go to uh, one of a dozen nurseries that just sell clematis. There's other clematis societies. Uh, there's also clematis databases uh, where you can learn everything about culture and you could find a picture of virtually any cultivar. So, uh, <clears throat> and you can even uh, see the Cavistic Nursery in Estonia. They have a, uh, a website of their own and you can see all of the different ones that were bred by Uno Cavistic. So. Okay, well we have uh, several people who were concerned because they've purchased clematises, clematis plants just recently, last year perhaps, they have a one-year plant, wondering if it's too late to cut, to, uh, to cut that back this year, to trim no, it back. No, no. No, if it's supposed to be pruned hard, you could prune it hard now. Right now? Mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, and the, several people were concerned about the amount of sunlight that's necessary for your clematis, and if you have any that you recommend for shady spots or with less sun. Um, yeah, there are, there are, uh, quite a few hybrids that won't bloom very well unless you get they get at least six hours of sun a day. There are several though that will bloom well on a north facing wall and actually uh, will do, they'll hold their color better if you keep them out of uh, bright sun. Oh, off the top of my head there's one called Blue Moon that's good for shade. There's another one called Dawn. Uh, Gillian Blades, which is one I showed you, uh, is also a good one for shade or to keep out of full sun. Uh, in these books, you'll find a whole list of clematis for shade or for our north. You know, they'll, you'll just find page after page with charts. Clematis for an east-facing east position, a south-facing position, or a north-facing wall. So there's lots of resources. I don't have them all memorized. So. Do you have a favorite book if you were just going to have one book on clematis? Uh, the illustrated um, dictionary, wherever it went. I don't know. Oh, yeah. 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 Can you hold yes. that up? <laughs> that has about uh, that has a description of over 600 cultivars and pretty much everything you need to know about growing and taking care of your plants. I have this book at home, and I I take it as big as it is out into the garden because I can never remember between different plants, what, what they need. It tells us great about the culture for each plant. It's, it's wonderful. <clears throat> Pardon? Toomey is the author. Uh, Mary, Mary Toomey. Yeah, go ahead. Mary Toomey and Everett Leeds. I think they're from England, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other person I'd recommend is Edith Malick. She's the head of the American Clematis Society. I've never, re I've never read her books, but she's written two books on clematis culture in North America. So. Are there certain varieties which you would not grow up a service berry or other small tree? Can any clematis be used this way? Uh, well, a service berry can eventually get pretty tall, and you'd want, a, you'd want one that can actually climb up out through it because what will happen is service berry will eventually just get big enough that it will totally shade the plant and you won't get any flowers. So you need... You need uh, a fairly aggressive clematis to climb in a service berry, and a lot of the viticella cultivars will grow between 10 and 20 feet, so I would pick something from the, uh, the viticella class or some of the late blooming hybrids like Pearl d'Azur, because uh, Pearl d'Azur will grow 20 to 25 feet. So. You talked about Polish spirit mm -hmm. and how vigorous it is. Mm -hmm. Can a plant that's that vigorous harm a tree or a small bush? Or can it, can yeah, it kill yeah. it? Yeah, my wife's staring at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a, my purpurplina elegans climbing in the red bud. It broke a big branch of the red bud uh -huh. off. And the etoil violet climbing in the variegated dogwood uh, tends to overwhelm it. You know, actually make the branches lay on the ground. So, yeah, I've done, I've made every mistake. You can planting uh, clematis with shrubs. Uh, you know, I planted Comtesse de Bouchard, which is a very aggressive pink clematis uh, in a viburnum that was very slow to to grow, and it just 
totally covered it and engulfed it. You know, it looked like kudzu vine <laughs> trying to choke it out. So yeah, you know, you do kind of have to mix and match. And also in several of these books, you'll get, they'll have charts. And you know, you can look up the name of a cultivar. It'll tell you how tall it grows and whether it's good to grow in a medium or large shrub or a small tree. So. Okay. You mentioned multi blue. Could you could that grow in shade? Yes, that's okay. good for shade. Okay, good. How difficult? How, talk about transplanting uh, clematis. Is it, is it difficult to transplant? No, they're not. You you need to dig a big hole because the roots really run, and you're going to set it back. But it'll it'll survive fine. It just won't look very good that year unless you really really take a huge root ball. But yeah, you know, it'll just set it back for that season, but it'll be fine after a year. And then, do you cut it back proportionately then? As you yeah, you, yeah, it'll do a little better. Okay, for a northwest patio exposure, which clematis would do well in a pot? Oh boy, I would say um, something like Gillian Blades or HF Young. They they only grow six to eight feet. So you can keep them under control in a pot, and they, they both will bloom with uh, not a lot of sun. And then would you put a structure in the pot for them to climb up? Yeah, I us yeah like a, a, a small trellis or an obelisk that you stick right in the pot. Would you ever think of, a, of an integrifolia in a pot? Uh, you could, I think they would eventually get root bound, but you could do it for one or two seasons and put like a tomato cage or something in there and let it, just climb up and amble out. So. All right. Should a plant that is plant, planted too close to a wall be moved back to 16 or 18 inches? Well, you know, if it's there and it's doing okay, I guess I wouldn't bother. But uh, you know, the theory behind that is you move it away from the foundation because you know the roots like to be shaded and cool the foundation can absorb heat in the summer and theoretically kill the plant so mm -hmm. i think that's the whole rationale for telling you to plant it 18 inches away but if if it's been there for several years and nothing has happened to it don't don't fix it if it's not broken i would say okay uh grow this person is growing clematis on a trellis against aluminum house siding will it interfere with the siding no it's not like ivy it's it shouldn't bother your siding at all. So, the leaves of my Jackmani clematis turn yellow every year on the bottom two to three feet. Is there anything I can use to prevent this? There is no mildew on the leaves prior to yellowing. That's just normal. Uh, lots of established clematis late in summer. The bottom three to five feet of the plant will turn brown or yellow, and uh, it's just it's just normal for certain. Uh, plants in the genus to do that and I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do anything about it. Okay. It just doesn't it doesn't look very nice but it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the plant. So would you plant something in front of it or something? Well, would you I deal guess with you it could. in another yeah, way? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, any idea why this person's sweet autumn clematis does not have a scent? It brooms, pro, it brooms blooms profusely. Uh, probably just genetic, genetic variation. Um, I have a seedling of my purpura recta where the foliage is not dark purple. The flowers are the same size, same color. They have no scent at all. So mm -hmm. I, it was just bad luck when you bought it at the nursery. Awesome. So if you want scent, just tear it out and buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, if you didn't prune a new plant to encourage new growth, to encourage growth the first year, can it be done two or three years later? Yeah, as long as you don't, as long as you're just, if you just have one or two little spindly stems, I would encourage you to prune it hard until you get several stems, because then it, it'll more effectively cover whatever you're trying to cover. And then would you, would you fertilize it especially or not? Then, then no, I would just feed it as normal, normal. yeah. How long does it take to establish a plant? Uh, that would really depend on the cultivar. Um, in general, uh, if you get a little thing in a two-inch pot, it'll take several years to get a, a big plant. But uh, most of the type three 
prune, you know, within a year, by the second season, you'll have a big plant. Mm -hmm. Some of the large flowered hybrids, they might take two or three years. Uh, like the one I showed you with the real bright bar, Mrs. Thompson, it would take several years to get a real big plant with lots of stems and lots of flowers. Mm -hmm. so it's a totally, I guess it, it depends is the answer. But. <laughs> the, the, the type three prune in general will establish themselves, uh, especially viticellas, mm -hmm. will establish themselves much earlier than the large flowered hybrids. Okay. Do you plant new plants deeper than where the plant is planted in the pot? In other words, you, you plant it deeper, the, the level of the soil is different. Uh, I usually do. Usually, if you get it, mail order or buy it in the nursery, the, the crown is right underneath the, the surface of the, mm -hmm. the soil and you want the crown between one and two inches deep. So I usually do plant it deeper. Is there a best time to transplant? Uh, I would probably treat it like a tree and when it's starting to go dormant in the fall, dig it up and move it and it should come back in the, in the spring. But I've moved them at all times of the year, and if you just keep them watered and prune them back, you know they'll they'll they won't look very good for a year, but then they'll be fine. So you talked about about planting sedum for, or a plant over the roots to keep them cool. Well, just a mulch do the job, or you yeah. need to have a live plant there. No, you don't have to have a a, a plant. A heavy mulch will will do. Uh, heavy mulch if it's wet will keep moisture around the roots so you know you that'll increase your chances of wilt oh yeah so let's go back over that <laughs> a heavy if you <laughs> if you put if you put a heavy mulch right against the roots of your clematis like two inches deep and, a, and you have sort of a wet season uh -huh. that means the stems where they're coming out of the ground will be wet and that's what the fungus likes to grow in so uh -huh. So uh, that's why it's better, really, to have a plant there. Yeah, rather but the than mulch. I mean the mulch will work, and there's lots of varieties that are immune to wilt. So, uh, but yeah, mulch will definitely keep the roots cool enough for the plant to thrive. But uh, I just have used sedum because you know you plant it and you're done. You I think it's great it to have that it. idea to have a plant <laughs> that you know is going to work. I've, yeah. I've tried other things, but mm -hmm. that seems to be a really good idea. Uh, this is a kind of a repeat question. I'll just go over it one more time. If you go out to buy a new clematis tomorrow, then this is a then you do the hard pruning right away when you plant it, or not? No, uh, when at the appropriate pruning time, is, which, would, would which this would be, be March, after you've had it grow for a year. Oh, okay. So As, if I after plant the first season, you prune your first year. Plant okay, so hard. we're not going to do a hard. If I'm not, I'm not going to do that with a new plant. No, if you're putting it in now, no. You might, you know, enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Plan it and enjoy it. And if it has only one or two stems, prune okay. it hard. Next in the year. Spring. Mm -hmm. Next year, in the spring. Okay. I would have done it wrong. I think I would have <laughs> whacked it back this year. Uh, <clears throat> I have seen clematis plants in a local grocery store's floral department. They are in bloom now. Will they survive if I plant them now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how a nursery gets you to buy the plant. You know, they put them out with the flowers, and you know, I've got to have that flower. Right. So, but they'll, you know, as soon as they're done, they'll be done probably for the whole season. Uh -huh. But they'll come back and bloom next year. So. Okay. So, if we this, how is, when can we plant these plants? Is is if we go out and buy a, a clematis now, can we plant it? Right now? Today? Yeah, I, that's how I've right. always done it. As soon as you get it, you put it in the ground. So. All right. Um, a lot of the mail order places that send them in the fall, well, you get a bare root, like uh -huh. wayside gardens and park seed. You get a bare root, and then uh, you plant it as soon as you get mm -hmm. it. If you can't plant it right away, soak it in water for a while so the roots don't dry out. If you can't, if you're not going to plant it for several days. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a, a problem. I, I don't it's a problem. It's a question. Um, I have the president at home in a box. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 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 
oh, you'd be really popular in Iowa City. <laughs> there aren't very many people here that voted for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have we have a, a brick pillar at the at the foot of our driveway, mm -hmm. and we've had some discussion uh, about the possibility of planting a clematis by that pillar, because there's someone in our family that's concerned that it'll be all covered up with vines, and you won't see the brick pillar. It's just going to be lots of vines. Now, is the president going to be? I know it's a wonderful, vigorous plant. Is it going to overwhelm this brick pillar? Would I be better off to, to, to buy a less vigorous clematis, or would it just be so wonderfully prolific that I'll be glad it's there? I would say the latter. I mean, it will probably, how big is the pillar? Oh, it's, you know, like, like about, it's brick, you know, it's like uh, It's a wide. square? Yeah. Well, that's pretty big. Probably wouldn't well, overwhelm it, but, you know, if it is pruned properly and you get 10 or 12 really vigorous stems, it'll cover a large area of your pillar, and when it blooms, you won't see the the brick, <laughs> yeah, because it, okay. it's a very heavy bloomer. But mm -hmm. I would plant it. I think clematis looks good on a mailbox. So. Oh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> what would you think about planting two different kinds of clematis? Should I one that blooms a little earlier and then one that blooms a little later, or is that just too much? No, I do that all the time. Uh, in the books, you'll often see, you know, advice. Okay with pruning, don't plant stuff that should be pruned differently together, and I don't pay any attention to it. If you have a large obelisk, if you plant your hard prune clematis on one side, and you keep the base of the plants far apart, so you, there's no chance to confuse them, and you know which one is which, mm -hmm. and they both can climb in that obelisk, and then the one that's light prune will give you really good early season flowers. Mm -hmm. The one that's hard prune will give you flowers on that obelisk late in the season, so you'll have flowers on that obelisk for most of the growing season, and you just cut the, the one off at the ground in March, leave the old foliage on there until the other one is growing pretty well, and you can tell them apart, and then the old foliage will deteriorate to the point you can just basically pull it off the obelisk, and you won't hurt, even though it's entangled with the other one, it uh -huh. won't hurt it at all. So, uh -huh. yeah, as long as you keep the base of the plants far enough apart so you, and you know which ones they are, I would encourage you to do it because you can, you know, if you want whatever structure you're trying to cover to have flowers for a long season, that would, that would be how I would go about doing it. So I don't pay any attention to, to that. And I can usually remember what's what, so. Well, it's, it, it seems to me that there are a lot of clematis that are particularly good later on, the viticellas and the, the later blooming ones. Where I have trouble with the earlier, now the Henry Eye is earlier, isn't it a little yes. bit? Yes, uh, Henry what, Eye. What other ones would you recommend that would be a good one to put with this later blooming clematis? Well, like, if, if you want white. Mm -hmm. um, or pink, um, or white. Or well, if you want pink, could plant Nellie Moser for your early and Comtesse T. Bouchard for your late. Uh, if you want white, you could put Henry I or Marie Bosala and then the Roca Cola. Uh, 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 there's also a late blooming one called John Huxtable that's hard prune that will grow six to nine feet. It's related to Viticella. So uh, you could pair those. And then sometimes, you know. You'll find lots of pictures in the books where people uh, where they'll just plant several together of different colors, you know, red, purple, white. So with the president, do you recommend anything? Oh, the president looks good by itself, but I, we have the president with Miss Bateman. I think it looks good. Good with Miss Bateman? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> how many how many clematis do you have in your yard? I don't know anymore. Uh, I know I planted way more than a hundred. Um, and probably more than a hundred varieties with three or four of some varieties, but some have died, so. Yeah. <laughs> From one means or the other. <laughs> so, but I don't know how many are actually there right now, but uh -huh. quite a few. <laughs> and, and, and in all of your yard, would the Romantica, is that the one? Is that your favorite? You, keep ta you talk about that one the most, I think. Uh, probably that. that would be my favorite at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I would have guessed, I would have maybe guessed that. That's good. Yeah. Wow, this is wonderful. We've had such a, a 
wonderful, wonderful forum today. Does, any other questions? Anybody have any other? Oh, we have a couple more here. Yes, I'll, I'll get when you. When you're planting multiple plants together, how far apart do you actually put them in the soil? How far do you put the oh, plants in the I soil? I would keep them at least uh, 24 to 36 inches apart minimum, although I've got several that are planted closer <laughs> than that. But, I mean, from... From learning from experience, I would say you need to plant them 24 to 36 inches apart. Alan, did you have something? Um, I have heard that the number three cultivars, after a while, end up having this really ugly kind of trunk that comes out of the ground. Is that so with them? Let me, let me, let me repeat the question quickly. Uh, she has heard that the, that the type three cultivars become ugly after a while in the ground. They have somehow have a big base. They, yeah. they have like a tree-like or shrub-like trunk. I think there's only two or three that do that. And the most common would be sweet autumn clematis would, would be the most common one. But you keep, uh, if you keep pruning it hard, you should get multiple new stems. Um, so and not, dominant, not big dominant stems like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Most most of the books say prune it a foot above the ground. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question about fertilizing. Uh huh. Do you stop fertilizing? I think that's what I read in here during the during the budding and flowering season. Do you right. stop fertilizing during the budding yeah. and I mean, flowering uh, season? That's that's basically what the I'm just repeating what the books what the sources say. They say you know feed it heavily or every two weeks if you're going to use a water-based fertilizer until, it until it's all butted out then stop till it's done with its first flush of flowers and then feed it you know and then the feed it's my experience the feeding really what it does is it really helps you have a nice second crop of flowers it doesn't really make much difference on the initial uh, on the initial crop of flowers yes Repeat the question. Uh, I would. Uh, the question is, can you grow something that'll compete with sweet pea? And I would say, <laughs> definitely yes. Uh, um, well, there's one called Paul For Paul Fargus that will kill wisteria. So, <laughs> so it, and it has small, fragrant white flowers. It's also called summer snow. Summer clematis summer snow. So any of the viticellas would certainly hold their own against sweet peas. So, mm -hmm. Any other questions? I want you to know that uh, Emil Rendersbacher has already said that he will give us a, a great forum in October. So when you get home, you have something to put on your calendar. Think the second Sunday in October. He's going to talk to us about fall gardening, what we should be doing in our gardens in the fall, and he's a wonderful, wonderful gardener and a great presenter. He'll be, he'll be just loaded with good information for you, so remember that for uh, the month of October. And then, of course, May 7th is our, as, as our uh, garden fair, Project Green Garden Fair at the Hawk, uh, Carver Hawkeye Arena from 9 in the morning until 11.30, and so that'll be a good place to pick up some wonderful plants that have lived through the winter in Iowa. I thank you so much for coming. This has been a wonderful forum. Thank you.